here at the 33rd Annual San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium. We're speaking with a doctor who feels like he's been to most of those, and he is Mike Dixon, MD, professor, surgeon, and clinical director at the Edinburgh Breast Unit at Western General Hospital in Scotland. That's a bunch of titles, but you do even more than that. Um, I do. I'm a, a breast surgeon, but I'm also a trained plastic surgeon, and I run the research unit uh, in Edinburgh, the, supported by Breakthrough Breast Cancer. Let's talk about that work. What we're interested in is why and how cancers respond to endocrine treatment, why some of them don't respond, and why patients who do respond eventually develop resistance in their tumor. And how are you searching for those answers? What are some of the ways? So the way we're doing it is that uh, we have a series of older patients who are treated with uh, neoadjuvant endocrine therapy for periods of up to nine months. And what we do is during the period of treatment, we take serial biopsies and then we're analyzing these biopsies. So we have a, like three groups of patients, a group of patients who respond rapidly and whose tumors shrink very quickly, a group of patients whose tumors shrink more slowly, and a group that don't shrink at all. And what we're doing is to see what happens in the cancer uh, at a genomic level that might help us predict very early on who's going to get a benefit, but more importantly, might give us an insight as to why some of these cancers don't respond and how we can add to the endocrine therapy to improve the outcomes for these women. Here in San Antonio, your name is in the book in a number of places, but can you tell us about your primary study? So what we've done is treated a, a large group of women, over 250, uh, with neoadjuvant letrozole, who originally uh, their cancer was too large to permit breast conserving surgery. We shrunk the cancer down. And then we've uh, done breast conserving surgery and looked at their long-term outcomes. Something that's worried uh, doctors in the past is, are we compromising local control and outcome by treating them with drug therapy first rather than proceeding straight to surgery? And what we've shown is that uh, if you shrink the cancer down, say it's a five centimeter cancer and then it's one centimeter at the end and you take that one centimeter area out and you give them radiotherapy and follow them up, does that produce good rates of local control? Well, the good news is it does. Out of five years, only 2% of women treated in this way have a recurrence providing they get radiotherapy. Not surprisingly, if they don't get radiotherapy, their recurrence rate is higher. The other thing we found is that HER2 positive patients seem to recur more often than HER2 negative patients. And that fits in with the other study we've got here, which is a group of older patients who we've treated with letrozole alone. Um, and we've looked at the time uh, that their cancer responds to letrozole and how quickly some of these cancers actually grow and the patient relapses. And there's a quite significant difference whether the cancer was HER2 positive or HER2 negative. So HER2 positive cancers have a much shorter uh, control time than HER2 negative cancers. These findings, what role do you see them playing in future breast cancer treatment? So the first thing to say is that uh, what we've shown is that in terms of local control, it's safe to shrink the cancer down with letrozole and then do surgery and radiotherapy. You have good rates of local control. What we've also shown is that if you treat patients for long periods, nine, 10, 12 months, that you can save three quarters of the breasts of these older women uh, who initially would have required a mastectomy. And I think that's really important because older women don't want to lose their breasts any more than younger women. And in fact, as somebody pointed out to me at breakfast this morning, older women have had their breasts longer than young women and probably are even more attached to them. Doctor, staying close to the patient beyond just their physical needs is important to you. Can you share how this runs through everything that you do? Yeah, I think it, it, it's really important that, um, you know, we don't suppose that because patients are older, um, they don't worry about treatment or worry about the cosmetic outcomes, because they do. There is good evidence for that. And I think what this does is it takes account of um, the, the problems patients suffer, even older patients who have mastectomies. One of the issues about older patients, their breasts are often uh, a little bit larger 
and a little bit more totic, and that's slightly droopy. And if you remove one breast, they're very lopsided. So uh, we've adopted a, a, an approach, uh, two different approaches, if you like. Uh, one approach is to uh, shrink the cancer down and save their breast, but um, the other approach is shrink their cancer down, look at their breasts and think, how can we improve the whole outcome for the patient? And what we offer a lot of these patients is the opportunity to have both breasts made smaller so that we take the cancer out and reduce the size of the cancer breast at the same time as we reduce the size of the opposite breast. And as one 85 year old pointed out to me, it took her 85 years before she looked like Marilyn Monroe. You factor in that there is more than just one decision to be made by breast cancer patients. There are multiple decisions on multiple layers. Can you explain? Yeah, so I think the big advantage for me about treating patients with letrozole up front is it gives them uh, an opportunity to look at all the options. It gives them an opportunity to discuss with their family what's best for them, because there are many decisions, you know, do you save your breast? Do you have a mastectomy? Um, do you have surgery to both breasts? Um, and so I think this gives time and I think uh, you need time to make informed choices. And I think sometimes we're so much in a rush to treat the cancer that it's only years later that we see the repercussions of what we've done because the, the patient's unhappy because the outcomes aren't quite what they expected. When you return to your research in Scotland, what avenues do you need to explore next? So um, what we found is these HER2 positive cancers don't do as well. So what we've got at the moment is we've got a series of about 50 HER2 positive cancers treated with neoadjuvant letrozole and we are um, looking at the changes, um, the mRNA changes, the genetic changes, the epigenetic changes that are occurring in these cancers, the HER2 positive cancers during treatment with letrozole and comparing them with the changes that happen in the HER2 negative cancers. We're also exploring with the pharmaceutical companies the opportunity of combining letrozole with uh, one of the anti-HER2 agents, Aceptin lapatinib, because there clearly is a need uh, to combine endocrine therapy with some of these anti-HER2 therapies in some of these older patients to provide benefits for them. Doctor, I know this work is very personal for you. That's why you look at every patient you treat as though she were your own mother. Um, yes, I do, because uh, often the patients will ask you, you know, what would you do if I was your mum? And I always say, if you were my mum, I would give you letrozole. And I'll tell you now, I do like my mum. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much. Fascinating conversation. Best of luck in your continued work, best of luck in finding your luggage, and best of luck in your dog letting you back in the home after being gone for so long. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> That's great. Right.